guarantee you, you're going to want to be on your feet right now for this praise party. Come on. Yeah. Y'all see, I told you so. I told you so. Hey. Yeah. Put the hands together like this. Hey. There is a sound. Sound from heaven that changes everything. I am free, no fear is holding me. Nothing can stop my brain. Oh, 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 we were made for freedom. Jesus has redeemed us, my friend. Oh, oh, oh sing it up together. Freedom reigns forever and ever. Let freedom fill the room.
Come on, sing it out. Sing it to the Lord today. Amen, amen. Nobody like our King Jesus. Amen. One more time. Come on, sing it to the King of Kings. Amen. was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for Thank you, Lord. and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore is your name
Unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Yes, I'm a child of God now. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me, all oh, love has called, has called hey. my name. cause I've been born again, born again. into the family of God.
child of God. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on, make this declaration over yourself right now, over your mind right now. Hallelujah. Keep singing that. Father, I thank you that the spirit of anxiety and depression and fear and worry is broken right now. We invoke the bloodline of Jesus Christ, God, over our minds and over our hearts, God. We command the spirit of anxiety to break right now over every heart and every mind right now. You loose your hold off of God's people. We are no longer slaves to fear, but we are children of God. We have the victory over every situation, over every circumstance. He knows our end from our beginning. We speak freedom in this house. I speak freedom in this house. Freedom in this house. Be free in the name of Jesus. You're free from fear. You're free from fear right now. Whoever you are, God is delivering you right now. Shades are breaking right now. I declare it. I declare it right now in the name of Jesus. But I am a child of God. Say it with faith. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Yeah. I am a child of God. I am, I am, I am a child of God. Sing it till you believe it with everything you are. I am a child of God. Yes, I am. I am a child of God. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Mm. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you.
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, and even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Come on, tell them. Even when I don't see it, come on, I don't have to see it. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Never stop. Hey everyone, James Ward here, and I have a very important and a personal favor to ask of you. I'd like to ask you to do something not for me, but with me and my wife Sharon on behalf of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know, in the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, God makes an incredible promise that gives me all kinds of hope that no matter how bad things seem to be in the world, with God's help, things can and will get better. And here's the promise from God. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Friends, now you can see why I said this promise gives me all kinds of hope. For those of us who have given our lives to God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, God promises to respond from heaven 
to our actions here on earth. If enough of us are willing and committed to humble ourselves and pray, God in heaven will listen to our prayers and heal our land. The healing of America will not and cannot come from a politician, a preacher, another election, or from a social justice movement. The healing of our land will only and can only come from God when we humble ourselves and seek him with all our hearts. So here's my ask. Just yesterday, God stirred Sharon's in my heart to pray and fast for 40 days for the United States of America, not for ourselves, our family, or even our church, but primarily for our nation. I know that there are tens of millions of believers in America who grieve for the spiritual and moral condition of our nation, just like us, and also believe that God desires to heal our land. We want to invite and encourage you to join us in fasting for 40 days leading up to our next National Prayer Altar event at Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday, November 1st. I do hope you'll attend National Prayer Altar either in person or online if you can't come to D.C. The fast will begin on Monday, September 18th, and I know that's not a lot of time to prepare, but this is something that's freshly deposited into our hearts. It's not necessary for you to completely abstain from food and water for 40 days, and I don't advise that. But you can give up one meal or certain foods for a portion of the day each day and do something as a sacrificial act of worship to God. Perhaps we don't see God doing more things for us today because we are unwilling to do things for him. To join us in fasting, all you have to do is text the word ALTAR, that's A-L-T-A-R, to 833-541-0522. That number will also be listed in the comments below. I'm excited because I know that God is faithful and always keeps his word. So after 40 days, something good will happen because of our obedience. Be encouraged, friends, and let's be the change that our nation desperately needs. God bless. I'll see you soon. Hey everybody, James Ward here. As always, I want to say good morning to you. Great morning. Better yet, and best of all, God morning to you, friends. Thanks for being all in. Thanks for being part of the Insight Church tribe. Today, we are going to hear the word of God. I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, that tells us that we should meet so much more as we see the day approaching. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, friends. And we're able to gather and to assemble online friends around the world. And I know that as we look around in society, we can see the day approaching. We can see that we are moving closer toward the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we need to gather to study God's word more and more. Thank you for being with us today. I want to encourage you to prepare your heart to receive God's word. I'm reminded of Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. And so when God tells his people to carefully observe the word of God, for this is your wisdom and your understanding. It is God's word that makes us a wise and understanding people. That through the revelation of the scriptures, friends, God gives us wisdom and understanding about every part of our life. I'm so encouraged, friends, about what it is that's going to take place in our life as the word of God is taught. We need your help, friends. Thanks for being a partner. Thanks for being a participant, friends, by investing and sowing into the mission and the vision of Insight Church. We need your help, friends. Provision for the vision that God has given us. You can do so by scanning the QR code, texting to give, visiting our website at insightchurch.org, mailing your support into our post office box, or by using your church app. Well, it's word time. This is the time. Get ready to receive, friends. It's going to be another life-changing, mind-renewing, faith-building time in God's word. Take a look at this. All right. Well, let's get to work this morning. Teaching on what? Resurgence. Come on and say it with me. Teaching on what? Resurgence. resurgence. We're teaching on resurgence, and um, I'm in between a few different series and a few different messages. You guys know how I am. I'm still teaching on forward. I'm still teaching on all these things throughout the year, but uh, each time it's layered. It's line upon line. We're building, and momentum is building. Uh, I'm going to come back. The last time I was here, I taught on... Uh, the dangerous diversity deception. The dangerous diversity deception. I encourage you to go back and listen to that message. 
so grateful for Pastor Lavelle ministering last week. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about something uh, concerning intimacy with Christ. And get this, from information to impartation. Intimacy with Christ from information to impartation. There is a big deal, a massive deal, as far as the East is from the West, between information concerning Christ and an impartation of the life of Christ. You can know a whole lot about Jesus and not be like him. We can know a whole lot about Jesus and not be equipped to live the way that he lived and to, uh, to fulfill the assignment that God has given to us here on earth. And so we're going to talk about intimacy with Christ and moving from information to impartation. And I can uh, promise you that as you move from information about Christ to impartation of the life of Christ, there will be a resurgence in your life. You will experience the very life of God. I was reading this morning of um, at the end of John 20 when Jesus was talking to Thomas, and Thomas, you know the story, says, I'm just not going to believe until I can touch the nail prints in his hands and, and on and on. And Jesus makes this statement to Thomas. He says, Thomas, you believe uh, because you've seen. But Jesus says, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. He says, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. And then he makes this statement. The scriptures, it says this, it says, and these things are written so that you may believe and have life in him. These things are written so that you may believe and so that you may have life in him. The word is written so that we can have the life of Christ. We taught extensively earlier this summer about being partakers of the divine nature of God. God has not just called us into information about Christ. He's called us into impartation of the life of Christ, which comes through the infilling and the person of the Holy Spirit. And folks, I'm telling you, it is a complete game changer when Christ begins to live in you. And when he increasingly, I should say, increasingly lives within you, to whatever degree the life of Christ, to whatever measure the life of Christ is operative in you, it is God's plan and desire for you and me to become more and more and more like Christ. There's, a, there's another level for you. There's another level for me. And we'll see it from the word of God. It is your faith. It is your desire, it is your hunger and your thirst that determines the measure of the impartation of the life of Christ that is operative in you. Something that we have to de develop faith for. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, so let's deal with this a little bit here. We've been teaching again all summer on this idea of resurgence. And resurgence, as I've shared, is a synonym for resurrection. Resurgence is a synonym for resurrection. So we're going to do a little, little teaching here. Um, I'm, I might teach this for the rest of my life. <laughs> when you talk about a resurgence and the resurrection power of God, I'll show you in a moment, this is God's agenda through the church on earth. It's the resurrection power of God. It's the life of God. And so resurgence, resurgence is a synonym for uh, resurrection. You know, if you, if you, if you feel or think I should move on to another teaching series, you haven't gotten it yet. You haven't gotten it yet. Always take note when, when, when pastors get stuck on something to say, God, what am I missing that you're not allowing us to move on? What is it you're trying to communicate to me that I haven't seen yet? God has a whole lot, whole lot more concerning resurgence and the resurrection power of God in our lives and in our church. Amen? Amen? All right, let's take a look here. Let's look at a few verses of Scripture here. Let's go to Romans 4.25. We're going to start here. New King James Version. Keep in, keep in mind this idea of resurgence is a synonym for resurrection. So Romans 4.25 uh, says this concerning Jesus, who was delivered up 
because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. He was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. That same verse of scripture from the New Living Translation says that he was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. Jesus was raised to life. Resurgence, resurrection. Why? To make us right with God so that you and I could be right with God. At the time of uh, Jesus' crucifixion, even from that moment, the veil of the temple was rent. rent. The word tells us in the book of Hebrews that it is through the the blood of Jesus that he has consecrated a new and a living way for us to enter the presence of God behind the veil, through the veil that is of his flesh, that Jesus has made it through him being raised to life, he's made it possible for us to be right with God. Somebody say amen. Amen. Are you thankful for that? Without him, there would be no way for any of us to be right with God. No matter what we did, no matter how hard we tried, no matter how much effort, no matter how good of a person we thought we were, without Jesus, there would be no way for any human to be right with God. That's why we worship him. With all of our heart, it's why we give him praise and sing songs of adoration to him, because he alone is worthy to to loose the seals and to open the books, because he alone has redeemed us to God by the shedding of his blood. He makes it so that we can be right with God. Somebody say amen. amen. Same verse of scripture from the Amplified Bible says, who was betrayed and put to death because of our misdeeds and was raised to secure our justification, big deal, a legal term, our acquittal, our acquittal, making our account balance and absolving us from all guilt before God. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's the work that Jesus has done through his resurrection, raised because of our justification. He was raised to make us right with God, to absolve us from all guilt before God. I'm going to give you these quickly. We'll come back to these, you know, sometime in the, in the future here. Just take a look and read with me 10 things that resurrection. When I talk about resurgence, it's synonymous with resurrection. The resurrection means a few things for us. Number one is this. Resurrection means that believers are justified or have been made right with God. That's what resurrection means for us. Number two, resurrection for the believer means that Satan, sin, and death have all been defeated. That's why the resurrection is so important. I'm going to talk to you about the work of God on the earth and the, the, the functionality of the resurgence or the resurrection power of God operating in our life every single day, every moment by day of the moment, a moment by moment oper- operation of the resurgence, the resurrection power of God operative in our life. So the third thing here, resurrection means that believers are united with Christ as sons of God, and have been made citizens of the kingdom of God. Are you grateful for that? Couldn't get there any other way. Couldn't qualify any other way. Number four, resurrection means that the scriptures are true. Scriptures were fulfilled. The prophecy was fulfilled. It means that the scriptures are true. Number five, resurrection means that the gospel can be preached. It means now that there's some good news to communicate to people because Jesus is alive and he's been raised from the dead. Number six, the resurrection means that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the son of the living God. Makes him distinctive in all the earth. Number seven, resurrection means that the Holy Spirit is available to all believers who can now be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what resurrection means to us. Number seven, number eight, Resurrection means that believers can live with great hope, peace that surpasses all understanding, and we can live with the blessed assurance of our eternal salvation, all because of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have great peace, great hope because of that. Number nine, resurrection means that believers will be raised to eternal life 
to reign with Christ forever and ever. And lastly, resurrection means that Christ will indeed judge the world. He will indeed judge the world, friends. So when we say that uh, God has plans for resurgence and resurrection in our life, these are, let's just say, constitute the mode of living for believers. It constitutes our lifestyle. The resurrection is not just an event, but it pertains to who we are. It's our identity, our hope, our life. It's all contingent upon the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about resurgence and resurrection, that's not just an event, but we're talking about the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit operative in our lives on a day-to-day basis. Remember, I'm talking about intimacy with Christ from information to impartation of the life of Christ. And it is the resurrection power of God that gave Jesus life and raised him from the dead dead. And that's God's plan for every believer, every day, all day, the same power that gave him life gives us life every moment of the day. Come on, that's not information, folks. That's impartation of the life of Christ. Come on, somebody say amen. Are you with me this morning? Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Let's look at this. Resurrection and resurgence, same thing. I said that those are synonymous. Resurrection and resurgence is not just about what we believe. It's about how we live. Resurrection and resurgence affects and continuously revolutionizes. Everybody say revolutionizes. The resurrection power of God affects and continuously revolutionizes our lives in every way, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, and financially for time and eternity. It's how we live. It's not just something that we believe. We live by the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It affects our life and continuously revolutionizes our life. There is no end. There is no termination to the regenerative power of the resurrection power of God operating in your life to change your life as much as you can believe for. Come on, you hearing me this morning? It is it is only our faith that limits the measure or the degree to which the resurrection power of God can change and revolutionize your life and our nation. It's a faith problem. There's there's no limits to what you can be, what you can do, how much you can do, what you can accomplish from God. The resurrection power of God is more than sufficient to revolutionize, change, heal, deliver, resurrect, whatever, give life, wherever there's things that are dead. The power of God is abundantly sufficient. It is the, the degree to which we believe and understand the power of God operative in our life on a day-to-day basis that determines how much change and revolution is taking place. Anybody tired of your life? You you don't like your life? I'm tired of mine. Come on. There's more. Why am I preaching so hard this morning to get you to believe God, God has more for you Come on, assess, assess your life. Assess the defunction. Assess the dysfunction. Assess everything that is not like God, that does not line up with the scriptures, and let faith arise for the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring life. Wherever a turnaround is needed, wherever a breakthrough is needed, whoever needs to be saved, whoever needs to be healed, whoever needs to be delivered, whatever needs to happen in our nation, I'm telling you the resurrection power of God brings life. But it only brings life to those who have faith to believe. You have faith to believe. Revolutionize. Are you with me this morning? The The word tells us If he spared not his own son, 
how shall he not with him freely give us all things? That if he raised Jesus from the dead, God will raise anything else dead that needs to be raised in your life. If there was something more difficult, it was the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Everything else is a lesser miracle. Everything else is a lesser task for the power of God. Somebody say amen this morning. Continuously revolutionizes our life. Continuously revolutionizes our life. It's the resurrection power of God that makes it so that we can say, uh, I'm not where I was last year. And watch, watch me next year. Come on, folks. Watch me next week. Continuously revolutionizing our lives. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> you see why I haven't moved on from this teaching yet? <laughs> Continuously revolutionizing our life. Look at this next one here. God... I call it is in the resurgence or the resurrection business. He's in the resurrection business. This is this is kind of what he what he does. This is his 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 operation on the earth. Let's take a look here. A few verses, a few verses of scripture. Luke chapter two, verse forty nine starts here. Jesus, about twelve years old or so, he makes this statement. He said to them, "Why did you seek me?" Jesus says, "Did you not know?" I must be about my father's business. Isn't that an interesting statement for a 12-year-old to make? He says, I must. I wasn't that mature at 12. I have any con- I, I must be about my father's business. In other words, there's a, there's a job that I have to do. There's a service I have to provide. There's an outcome that he's looking for and a return that the father is expecting. I'm here to be about my father's business. And I'm here to tell you that each and every one of us here today, we must be about our father's business. And I'm going to show you from the word of God, he's in the business of resurrecting stuff. He's in the business of affecting things by his resurrection power. We're going to see it. This is, this is the business that, that the father is, is in. You know, you read the parable of the talents. Um, the king tells his servants, he says, occupy, or some translation says, do business until I come. Do business until I come. You know, that's, that's increasing, progressing, healing, delivering, bringing change, advancing, moving. This is the business of the father here on, on earth. Let's take a look here. If Jesus was about his father's business, then he gives us what I call the company mission statement in Luke chapter 4. Listen at the company mission statement of the father's business. Jesus says this is it. It says, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, the things that were written. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Here's the mission statement of the father's business. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord or the anointing, you could say, is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, all of the eyes of those who were in the synagogue, were fixed on him, verse 21, and he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He said, this is the mission statement of my father's business is to to heal, is to deliver, is to set free, is to preach the word of God, to preach the, uh, the acceptable year of the Lord. He says that's fulfilled, and Jesus from that moment The Bible says the next thing he did, he went to a place. We were just there last week. He went to a place called Capernaum into a synagogue where we stood. And it was there that he met a man who was filled with demons. And he began to cast out demons because he was doing his father's business. He was now operating in the power of God to bring life, to bring healing, 
to bring deliverance, to bring freedom to people who need it. That was the father's business. And I got news for you. It's still the father's business. It's still his business. The only difference is Jesus is not here. He's delegated the business to us. Are you hearing me this morning? But the mission hasn't changed. The business hadn't changed. The company hadn't changed. He's just employed a whole lot more people than Jesus to do the same things that Jesus did. Amen. Folks, I'm telling you, the world, society needs the church to get this message like you wouldn't believe. There is no hope for this world outside of the church operating in the resurrection power of God to fulfill God's business of bringing life in this world. There is no hope anywhere else. There's no hope anywhere else. Accept a church that is operating in the power of God. Somebody say amen. amen. It's the Father's business. It's his, it's his service to all mankind. Remember Jesus says, I didn't come to be served. I came, I came to serve. I didn't come to be served. I came, I came to, to fulfill my, my Father's business. God so loved the world that he, that he gave. He's serving salvation. He's serving deliverance. God wants to serve life and healing. He wants to serve salvation to people. It's the Father's business on, on earth. Listen, ultimately, we see God's resurgence, his business of resurrection and, and operation, both through the life of Jesus, evidenced by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we just saw, but it's continued through the church. It's continued through you and I being raised up to carry on the Father's business and the ministry of Jesus Christ of bringing his resurrection power to a dead world. To bring life to a world that is dead is the assignment of the church of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, he, um, we're here to, to, let's just say God is marketing his business through the church. He is, he, is, he is advertising what heaven is like. He's advertising his company through his people. You know, you know your life and my life is intended to be a billboard for the goodness of God. <laughs> Are you hearing me this morning? You know, some, you know you, uh, sometimes you sit at the traffic light and, you know, you see companies now plumbing companies, air conditioning companies, for example, they drive vans and trucks and, you know, they, they brand themselves on their trucks and you got a, you know, their website, their phone number and a picture of a guy with his wrench because they got a plumbing business. You know, you know, they could use a plain old white truck to get to the job and carry the materials. But instead, they, they market the company on the vehicle. Come on, man. Come on. Why do they market the company and put the wrench and the guy with the smile and, you know, he's opening up the drain, the phone number, and the website? Because they know that when you're sitting at your, at your stoplight, like me, the truck in front of you or next to you has a picture of some heating and air conditioning com company on it. Four Seasons Heating and Air Conditioning. You say, oh, you sit there and say, would you look at that? They already know in four weeks' time, <laughs> when your air condition stops working, they want you to call them yes. so they displayed or marketed their services on the truck because they knew it was a matter of time before you was going to need somebody to provide that service. Yes. Oh, I'm telling you, you are God. God doesn't need a truck. He puts his image. Your life is to be a picture of his goodness. Your life should be a picture of healing, a picture of prosperity, a picture of God's grace. Your life is a picture of his peace. Your marriage, your family is a picture of the faithfulness of God because he knows it's just a matter of time before people around you are going to have a need. But when they see your life, instead of them calling a plumber, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's, it's part of his assignment that we're here to market 
the resurrection power of God, to show life. People in a dead world, in a dying world. But they can look at some Christians and see that the life of God, the blessing of God is operative in your life and in your family. God has raised us up to be witnesses or advertisers or marketing agents for him. Now, if the plumbing truck is all rusty, all broke down, sitting over on the side of the road, you're not going to call that company. So watch this. When, when Christians, when we're bitter, upset, dysfunctional, sick, broke, who's going to call a God for that service? It's when they see the blessing. And they see the peace of God. We're advertising for the Father's business on earth of bringing resurrection power and life. He who came to give us life and life more abundantly, your life and my life is to be a witness of the resurrection power of God. Are you with me this morning? <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. Herein is my Father glorified. Jesus makes it plain. John 15, 8. You want to know how my Father gets glory? It's when you bear much fruit. This is, how, this is how the Father's company looks good. This is how heaven looks good. This is how the Father's faithfulness is displayed. Herein is my Father glorified when you bear much fruit. It's God's call on our life. Somebody say amen. Come on. When unbelievers and family members and people need God, she's ready to look at our lives to see. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's go a little bit further here. If you, Romans chapter 4, verse 13. Look at this. Oh, this is a big one here. I'm talking about still intimacy with Christ from just information to impartation, the life of Christ, the resurrection power of God operative in our life. There's an impartation of the life of God, the spirit of God, not just the information. Look at this, Romans chapter 4, verse 13. Very important. It says, for the promise, this is speaking of Abraham in Romans chapter 4, for the promise that he would be the heir of the what? The promise from God that Abraham would be the heir of the world. Think about that. God made a promise that this guy would inherit the world. Now watch this. That promise that he would be the heir of the world, very important, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but it came through the righteousness of faith. Isn't that interesting? Because now... The word of God tells us that there was a promise that Abraham would be the heir of the world. But not just Abraham, to Abraham and his seed. Amen. Everybody say, that's me. That's me. It's a dangerous statement. <laughs> say that again. Say, that's me. that's me. Come on, come on. There was a promise. I, I got 45 pages of notes. I'm not in a hurry because, because I'm talking about resurgence. Somebody's going to get this today. There was a promise to Abraham and to his seed that they would be the heir or the ones to inherit the world. Now, I don't have it here. Galatians 3.29 tells us very clearly. You can write that down. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's what? And what? Heirs according to what? Come on. The Bible says you are included. Whatever God said and did to Abraham, when you are in Christ, God says he makes the same exact covenant with you. I'm here to tell you this morning, you are an heir of the world. Come on, let's, let faith arise. You're, you're an heir of the world. 
Pastor James, I'm trying to get an apartment. I can't get an apartment. Don't worry about that. You're an heir of the world. You might be making minimum wage or whatever. Listen, I'm telling you, your inheritance, you are an heir of the world. And what, what's the determining factor? The degree to which the resurrection power is operating in your life. <laughs> the, Lord, the Lord sent me this morning to tell you it's time for you to get your stuff. And it's time to possess your possessions, Amen. folks. And he's empowered us to do it with the same Resurrection power that brought Jesus up from the grave, that same resurrection power is available and operative in our lives to revolution our lives to the measure that we become the heirs of the world. I'm telling you, in the last days, God is going to raise up some bona fide Christians who believe this and live it and operate in it as he's perfecting his bride to prepare for the coming of the Lord. I'm, I'm telling you, God is faithful. He's going to raise up some people who believe. Are you with me this morning? Is this too much? All right, come on, you with me? He was heir to the world, him and his seed through the righteousness of faith. You know, what's, what's true today, if... What much of what we see happening in America today, if, if the righteous don't or won't become heirs of the world, the wicked are glad to do it for us. I'm telling you, if we don't, if we don't decide that we're heirs of the world to, uh, world to agree with God's word, the wicked are glad to do it. That's why more and more we see Universities being lost. Drag queens teaching in grade school. Middle schools lost. Government seats, the Senate, the House, all of Congress being lost. The movie studios being lost. Arts and entertainment being lost. If the, if the, if the body of Christ is unwilling to become heirs of the world, I'm telling you, the wicked is happy to do it. But we're here to fulfill and be about our father's business. And his business is for the kingdom to come here on earth, just like it is in heaven, by the resurrection power of God operative in the church of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me this morning? <laughs> it's not a time to be intimidated or to be fearful. But to know by covenant we are the seed of Abraham and as a promise that we are to be heirs of the world. Didn't God tell Adam and have dominion? Yeah. Romans chapter 8, the highest heaven belongs. Uh, I'm sorry, Psalms chapter 8, the highest heavens belong to God, but the earth he's given to the children of men. We see it, we see it all, all throughout the, the scripture. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Let's go down a few more verses here. Again, as it is written, I have made, speaking to Abraham, I've made you a father of many nations. First, he says the promise is that I've made you the heir of the world and to your seed. Now he's telling Abram here, I have made you a father of many nations. You know what that means? That means authority over the nations. That means the power, watch this. The nations didn't define Abraham. Abraham defined the nations. See, the DNA comes from the father to the child. The child does not determine the identity of the father. It's the father that determines the identity of the child. America does not define us. We define the nation. We define the nation. Can't you see how this will make a difference in America? Yeah. If the church knew this and believed this stuff, I don't need anything from the nation. 
Man, she can't tell us anything. It's part of our covenant as a seed of Abraham. We father the nation. We define, we define the nation. The nation doesn't define us. That's, that's, that's why, let me tell you something. You know, you know, you will never see James Ward speaking to me. Never, you're, gonna see me you're not going to see me wearing either a red MAGA hat or a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. You're not going to see me wearing either one of them. I don't need that stuff. I don't need that stuff. It doesn't define me. I'm here to define it because I'm the seed of Abraham. Come on. And it's the resurrection power of God operative in the church that he's given that authority to his people alone. But Pastor James, are you Democrat or Republican? Neither. <laughs> Don't insult me with that garbage. I'm a son of God and a citizen of the kingdom of God. Don't insult me with that. Whose side are you on? You remember the angel came to Joshua? Joshua, who are you for? Us or them? The angel said, neither. As commander of the Lord's armies, I'm here to represent Jehovah Sabio. Not on anybody's side. Not Democrat or Republican. You, I'm not for Trump or Biden. I'm for Jesus. Here, here's a good one. Watch this. Tell you where, where the church has been divided. God help us. The church has even been divided. I'm speaking generally now. The church has been divided over COVID. Watch this. I'm a, let, me, let me just settle this right quick. Do you think you should have gotten the vaccine? Or do you think we shouldn't have got the vaccine? Church is divided over that issue. I got news for you. Let me fix it. Jesus can heal people who didn't get the vaccine. Watch this. And if necessary, he can heal the folks who got the vaccine. Doesn't matter to him. What are we arguing about? Stop it. I'm speaking to the body of Christ. Stop it. You heal folks without the shot and heal people from the shot. It doesn't matter. Come on, folks. We're heirs of the world. The seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham. Look, look at this. Let's continue. Romans 14. Watch this. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Listen at this. In the presence of him whom he believed. Everybody say believe. believe. Everybody say faith. faith. So watch this. In the presence of him who believed, faith in the presence of God, already had the promise that he would be the heir of the world along with his seed. Now, remember I told you that, that God is in the business of resurrection? Watch this. In the presence of him whom he believed, here it is. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Folks, you're talking about the resurrection power of God coupled with a prophetic declaration that when things don't exist, by the creative and the regenerative power of the resurrection, anointing, the resurgence, and the power of God, you're talking about people who can speak into existence something that's not even there. Oh, folks, come on. It doesn't exist. But we serve the God who gives life to the dead. And because of his resurrection power, when we're operative in the spirit and we have faith based upon the word of God, we can speak it into existence. Speak it into existence. It's the power of God that does that. It's the, it's the power of speaking and declaring God's word over dead things. Whatever, whatever there is in your life that's 
that's dead, that's not producing, that's not fruitful, whatever in your family, whatever in your business, whatever in your company, we serve the God who gives life to the dead and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. I'm telling you, folks, that's moving from information to impartation of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me this morning? Somebody say amen. Amen. Did you tell how excited I am about this stuff? This is why why we go to Washington, D.C. This is why we, we say yes when the Lord stirs our heart to fast for 40 days. I'm telling you, the, the, moment, the moment my foot gets off the airplane, we start walking and praying and prophesying over this nation and taking authority over the devil. You don't just sit back, oh, America's so bad. Look how bad it is in America. Where's the church? Who's been given the keys of the kingdom? Oh, man, may God help the church to arise, to move from impartation from information to impartation of the life of Christ. I'm telling you, our families, our homes will never be the same. I speak it and declare it in Jesus' name over our church, over your life, and over your family. We call things that be not as though they were. You are blessed of God. You are highly favored. In Jesus' mighty name, you will fulfill the number of your days. Not one of us will die premature. In the name of Jesus, there is none sick and feeble among us. In the name and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, I thank you for a breakthrough of blessing of God, that we are blessed and highly favored. Lord, I thank you that our children are serving God. Our grandchildren are serving God. None of them will live outside of your will. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that deliverance is taking place, Lord God, and that you are using our lives in Jesus' mighty name to be agents of change and transformation in this world. We speak it even though it doesn't look look like it. We call the things that be not as though they were because we serve a God who gives life to the dead. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Somebody say amen. Amen. Come on and bless his name. Bless his name. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. It's the power of God. It's the power of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let me give you a few more here. Look at this next principle. Resurgence in the church must precede revival in the culture. If things will ever get wet, wet better in, in the world around us, a resurgence in the church, this, the resurrection power of God has to precede any kind of life in society and in the culture. And I'm telling you, the world is, is hopeless right now. A few more verses of scripture. Look at this. Romans, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Here's the issue. I'm talking about the resurrection power of God, but here's the issue. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Paul writes this. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead. And here's the result. And then Christ will give you light. Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Jesus will respond and give you light. He says it. We have to respond. I want, I want you to get this. You know, when, when the Bible says here to awake and to arise, both of those speak about darkness. When you sleep, you're looking at the bottom of your eyelids, it's dark. Anything in the dead, in the grave, in the tomb is dark. But watch this. It says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and then Christ will give you light. It does not say that Jesus is going to wake you up and take you out. But when you make a determination by faith to awake and to arise, then he will give you the light. Let me, let me show it to you from the word. Jesus stands back and he says, your brother, he tells Mary and her her sister Martha, your brother is asleep, but I have come to awaken him. 
I've come to awaken him. But watch how he did it. He stands outside the tomb. And all he does is issue his word to a dead guy. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. You know what you don't see? Jesus didn't go running up in the tomb to pick Lazarus up and bring him out. He was a rabbi that would have defiled him. Jesus is sometimes not going to defile himself coming into your dead situation to get you out. He speaks the word for you to come out of it. And then he says, I'll give you light. There's some things we have to, we have to come out of. There's some folks you got to let go of. There's some relationships you got to come out of. There's some habits you got to stop. There's some things you got to do. You got to stop. And then Christ will give you light. He just said, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead guy with no sensory nerves in his ears heard the word of the Lord. Why? Because he gives life to the dead and he calls those things that be not as though they were. He didn't go in the tomb to get Lazarus. Lazarus had to come out. Lazarus had to awake you who sleep. Lazarus had to arise from the dead. And Jesus said, and then. I'll give you light. Are you with me this morning? <laughs> you didn't go pick Lazarus up. Lazarus had to obey the word of the Lord to come out. He had to obey the word of the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Let me give you another. Romans 13, 11. It says this, and do this. Knowing the time. Or the lateness of the hour in the last days. That now it is high time to do what? To awake out of sleep. This is, this is a word to us. Now, knowing the time and where we are, look around the society. The, the, the scripture is at, admonishing us. Look at the time. And then conclude it is time now for you to awake out of your sleep. It's time for sleepy Christians to get up. It's time for lethargic Christians to get up. It's time for Christians not operating in their purpose to get up. It's high time to awake out of your slumber. For our salvation, the, the, the Greek, the soteria, our, your salvation, which means to break the oppression of the enemy in your life. Your salvation is nearer than when we first believe. But God is calling the church into awakening. He's calling us into awakening by the resurrection power of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the name of Jesus. This is, this is how God intends us to live. And it comes through the impartation of the life of Christ. Take a look with me. Roman, Philippians chapter 3. We'll look at this last passage of scripture. Philippians 3. Remember, from information to impartation. Watch what Paul writes here in Philippians 3, 7. He says, but what things were gained to me? What things were gained to me? That's uh, anything and everything in life. What things were gained to me? Anything and everything in life, whether it's career, home, money, business, success, status, whatever it is. He says, whatever things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. I'm about to explain to you how to be awakened. He says, whatever, whatever's been gained to me. You know what? That life and success in life tends to make us sleepy spiritually. Come on, you hear me? The comforts of life tend to make us sleepy spiritually. So this is how you get awakened. He says, whatever's been gained to me, gained to me, whatever it is, house, car, money, you name it, whatever it is, whatever's been gained to me, I have counted those things lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count how many things? All. Say it with me, all things. all things. He says, I count. All things, what? 
I count all things lost. Here's the key. In exchange for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I'm telling you how to, how to be awakened. He says, I count everything and anything that this world has to offer. It means nothing to me. I count it loss in exchange for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Let me say it this way. Not just knowledge. There's a difference between information and knowledge. There's a difference between information and knowledge. Information, you can get that anywhere. Knowledge is really knowledge. Knowledge is knowledge. Let me, let me explain to you just to, to help us understand. There's a difference between having information and knowledge. Knowledge or knowledge means experience. Yes. Let me explain it this way. Anybody can get um, a recipe off the internet. Anybody can just download a recipe off the internet. Let me tell you something. Man, my grandmother could cook. She could cook. You know the real people that know how to cook don't use recipes? I'm going to out at somebody now. <laughs> the people that really know how to cook don't really use recipes. A recipe is information about how to cook. The real cooks have knowledge about cooking. They have experience. experience. They've done it so many times. They know what to do, and they don't need a recipe. I don't think my grandmother owned a teaspoon. I don't think she owned a set of measuring cups. You're trying to figure out a teaspoon or a tablespoon and a, a, a cup. I don't, real, real folks that know how to cook, my grandmother, my Aunt Marie, they, they didn't measure nothing. They, they put stuff in the pot, no measuring stuff, just pour this, put this, uh, this, 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 that. Watch this, and then put the lid on and left the thing alone. You keep opening the pot. You, you keep lifting up the barbecue grill. That means you don't know what you're doing. They would, they, would, they would put stuff in the pot and put the lid on, and somehow they get the flame just at the right, at the right height, just the right amount of fire, and would leave the thing long alone. And a few hours later, just by the smell, they would come by and turn the fire off. It's ready. No timer. That's, that's knowledge and experience about how to cook. You don't get that from a recipe. And I'm telling you, when Paul says, I count all things for the knowledge of Christ, we've got to move from information about Christ to knowledge about him. I've experienced him. I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Come on, listen. I want to finish this up. For whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Verse 9. Verse 9. And be found in him. And be found in him. It's the reward of total surrender. It's being found in him. When your life becomes synonymous with the life of Jesus to be found not beside him. Yeah, he walks with me and he talks with me, but there's a graduation from walking and talking with him to being found in him. What was the cost? I count everything lost for the excellence of the knowledge of him that I may be found in him. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. 
that I may be found in him. And that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Folks, that's moving from information about Christ into an impartation of the life of Christ, from being beside him and walking with him to being found in him. And the cost is surrendering everything I know, counting it as rubbish, that I may gain the excellence of knowing him, to be found in him, and to operate in the power of his resurrection. You get anything out of the word of God this morning? Wow, what an amazing teaching uh, today. Friends, I shared earlier in today's program that the word of God makes us to be a wise and understanding people. And God tells us to simply ask him for wisdom. If we lack, lack wisdom, we can ask God for it. And friends, I agree with you right now from the truth of God's word that's been declared over your life that the word of God will make you wise. I speak and declare and agree with you right now the wisdom of God over every situation, friends, any challenge that you may be facing, any obstacle that may stand before you, friends, any unanswered questions or unresolved matters in your life, in Jesus' name by faith, I speak the wisdom of God over your life, friends. Thank you for being a partner with us, investing into the mission and the vision of Insight Church. We need your help. We need your partnership, friends. We can do so much more together than we ever could individually, friends. So thanks for being uh, a partner with us. You can scan the QR code, text to give, visit our website, mail your support, friends, or use your church app uh, to be a blessing to our church as we endeavor to be a blessing to thousands and thousands of people around the world. I want to speak God's blessing over you by saying the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in Jesus' name. Remember, Jesus loves you. Pastor Sharon and I love you. Be well, be encouraged. I'll see you next time.
baptized in the water. Oh, I've been baptized in the water. This is my child. This is who I am. 